بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وأصحاب الأجمعين وأمهات المؤمنين ربي شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقطة من لساني يفقو قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته my dearest sisters Welcome to back to our weekly session on Tafsir of Quran. First of all, let me apologize with uh, a little bit of technical uh, hiccup. Uh, we are slightly late, um, but I will, inshallah, with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will try our best to finish it in time. Inshallah, today we will be doing, um, I can call it, some Some people call it twin sister of Surah Ad-Duha, which we did last week. Um, today we will be doing Surah Insharah, or you can call it uh, Surah Nasharah. Or you can call it, or many, many tafasir uh, give it the heading of Alam Nashra. And Alam Nashra is the first two words of the uh, first ayat. Um, and we will find out what uh, uh, Nashar means in a minute. In a minute. Um, first of all, we will, we will go to introduction. Uh, just give me two seconds so yeah this is also a uh, makki surah and uh, the subject matter of this surah resembles so closely with um, with surah at duha which we did last week and um, um, both surahs were revealed in about <clears throat> same period under similar conditions uh, so Surah Inshara or Alam Nashra was revealed in Mecca soon after uh, Surah ad duha and uh, this was uh, confirmed by um, uh, uh, Abdullah bin Abbas, who was the cousin of the Prophet وسلم, that it was sent down uh, soon after Surah ad duha And as I said, the, the situation around the Prophet وسلم, uh, that period of time uh, I would say the early time, the very early time of his, uh, soon after he became uh, a prophet and when the job of uh, da'wah was given to him, um, this happens. Um, the aim and object of this surah was to console and encourage the Holy Prophet وسلم, during his very hard time. And we have already discussed the condition of Mecca in Surah ad duha when he started his mission and how people treated his uh, his preaching. Now, um, um, what I mean, most of you know that the condition of uh, uh, Mecca, the time when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became the Prophet of uh, Allah, they were idol worshipping happening everywhere the community was engrossed uh, ing fully in idolatry and polyistic uh, customs and practices and there was a filth of immorality and indecency prevail all around when we are not following the divine laws and we are following the man-made laws it is heavily heavily contaminated by shaitan and of course immorality becomes the the first on top of the list to follow there was a wickedness and corruption uh, you know corrupt practices everywhere in the society the weak were very weak and oppressed the powerful were suppressing uh, powerless uh, people girls were being buried alive tribes were uh, subject to one another to you know tribes were fighting on petty little things and these fights would carry on for years and years um, and men from from the two groups of people who are fighting with each other the, the, the whole you know generation of men would die and then they would wait for the next generation to grow up and then they would resume their fighting that's how their culture was um, no one's life and property and honor was safe unless he had a strong you know uh, group or family backing him 
and all this around him grief prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because uh, he had a very sensitive nature and this was clashing badly with with his uh, with his fitra um, but he could not find a way to cure all this chaos so um, so these surahs both these surahs were like um, like um, a huge help coming to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we're going to do the ayats and before that I will quickly do a quick recitation. A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajeem. Bismillahi ar-Rahmani ar-Rahim. Alam nashrah laka sadrak wa wadha'na anka wizrak alladhi anqadha dhahrak wa rafa'na laka dhikrak فَإِنَّا مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى إِنَّا مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ وَإِلَى رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ رَبِّ شَرْحْ لِي صَدْرِي وَيَسْرْ لِي أَمْرِي وَحْلُ الْأُقْتَةَ مِّن لِسَانِي يَفَقُ قَوْلِي The first ayah is in a question form. And this is like a sort of a, um, um, a question. I'll, I'll explain it to you in a minute. Um, First of all, let's go through the words. I've put down important words of each ayah uh, in front of you. Shara. Shara means opening up. OK, and Sadr means chest. Shara can be opening up anything. But when it is combined with sodar, chest, then opening up normally would mean to open up the meaning of something which was before complex. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can sharah our sadr as well, mine and your as well, um, to make a matter which we would not understand previously. Allah made it easy for us to understand it. Okay. So it is in when it comes to the Prophet Sallallahu's uh, referring to him because the ayah is directly for him. It's like Allah has expanded his chest for him. So Allah put his uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's mind at ease. The one so we can also say the one whose chest has been expanded now is very pleased and contented. So whereas before, the, 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 he was in a state of unease and incomfort. So this can happen with anybody. If Allah choose to expand anybody's chest to make them understand the matter, um, and not only to make them understand the matter, do we will we will go through this uh, in a minute. So I don't want to jump into too many things. So Allah's messenger is completely contented with what Allah has given him now. So any barrier in between has been removed. So he, subhanahu wa sallallahu wa sallam, has full and total understanding of the message. Receiving and understanding the message pleases and relaxes his mind. So, you know, there is one thing is receiving the inf information. And the other thing is receiving the information and understanding the information fully. OK, so these two things is expanding, expanding the chest. Now, going back to um, other prophets, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expanded uh, their chest, shara their sada, uh, was, uh, let's say, Prophet Musa alayhi salam, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him uh, to Fir'aun to propagate uh, the message of Islam. Um, what did uh, Musa alayhi salam uh, prayed? Because if you know that Musa alayhi salam had a stutter problem and has a strong temper as well. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him to Fir'aun uh, to introduce him to Allah's message, one and only Allah, he hears um, Prophet um, Firaun started talking evil words uh, to Prophet Musa, you know, tell him, ridiculing 
and ridiculing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ridiculing him and ridiculing that message as well. You know, so this made Prophet Musa angry. And when he was angry, his stutter becomes worse. So his, his tongue becomes more locked up and he just could not convey the message. So he asked Allah to expand his chest and said that Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri. In Surah At-Taha, um, he said that my master expand for me my chest and make my job easy for me. So now we can put in the in the Shara Sadr, we can put information, getting information, understanding the information fully and then conveying the information the best possible way. All these three steps, the Sharah Sadr that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is mentioning here um, is with regard to his Prophet. It comes in, in, in this, all these three steps. So this means that for a Prophet, the experience of receiving the divine revelation is physically and emotionally draining and very tough. So they need that extra divine support to make them at ease and calmness with their role as a messenger from Allah because their role is burdensome. It's, it's, it's a difficult role. They need to have full backing, divine backing behind them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then not only just tell them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing that as well. Prophet sallallahu when he received the information and then understanding the information and then conveying it to the best of uh, his ability. Now, um, according to some scholars, Shara Sadr in this particular ayah, because it's directed uh, directly to uh, Prophet sallallahu is also it also means physically cutting the chest because the first one is uh, figurative it means something else but Allah is saying we're opening your chest but but what happened that the Prophet ﷺ, twice in his life Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered uh, angel Jibreel salam, along with a couple of other angels to open the chest physically of the Prophet ﷺ, and clean it and it was cleansed with uh, the water of Zamzam. So uh, this happened once in his childhood when he was living with his wet nurse uh, Sayyida Halima Sadia um, and, the, and he was playing outside uh, with her son and this happened and her son came running and said that my brother Muhammad is being, this is what happened to, to him. Um, the second time was before the Prophet ﷺ left for the journey of uh, Isra wal Mi'raj, uh, which is the night journey to Palestine first, and then the ascension to the heavens to uh, meet, speak to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Another explanation of Shara Sadr, which is expanding the chest, that Allah makes the chest or the heart of his believing slave comfortable with Islam. Now that is a huge blessing and that happens with a lot of people. That can happen with me and you. Uh, we are both sitting here and I know that as far as I'm concerned, I'm completely and fully satisfied with Islam. I do not have any doubt whatsoever. There are lots of things that I cannot understand or don't understand. There are lots of things which I don't see the wisdom because the divine wisdom might have different uh, angles to it. Um, things happening to me now, I might be a little bit, I would say uneasy, anxious, depressed, annoyed, but I don't know if this is good for me or bad for me. But if I'm trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fully, I know that this can be a my little test or my little struggle, but at the end it will be it will be good for me because Allah has chosen this for me. So 
expanding our chest or expanding anybody's chest or or shana sadar for any believer is also means comfortable with islam it is extremely important that messengers who carry a heavy burdensome duties fully trust and believe their lord and despite the harsh treatment of people they still are comfortable with their job and when it comes to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's case it was even harder to convey the message as he was you know on daily basis he has to go through you know people humiliating him trying to humiliate him cursing him openly right in front of his face being spat at made fun at people laughing and putting their fingers in their ears as soon as prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam opened their mouth they start clapping when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is reciting uh, the ayats of quran and this is what he sallallahu alaihi wasallam has to go through on daily basis so allah expanded his chest to have immense patience yet believing in allah at all times so he gave prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh the quality the tool of patient at that time is remember those who have read uh the the sira the life and the legacy and the life work and legacy of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam his mission basically um which is called the sira we would know that the makkan time was harsh time for prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the handful of uh revert muslims um but they were not allowed by allah subhanahu wa taala to retaliate number one they were not strong enough to retaliate and number two they were not even allowed on 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 a personal basis or collectively the only uh, training they had to go through was start trusting and believing allah and second patience these were the two mandatory things they had to do remember there was no salah there was no uh, uh fasting there was no charity there was no hajj umrah anything mandatory on them there was no ritual uh worship mandatory on them the only two things were to understand the oneness of allah and accept it fully and start believing into it and start trusting into it and be patient There is another divine wisdom in expanding the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's chest as this chest will carry the Quran. Allah referred Quran as a heavy word. In Surah Al-Muzammil, Allah says, "Inna sanul sanulqi 'alayka qawlan thaqila." Qawlan means word and thaqila means heavy. so indeed we will cast upon you a heavy word so we can conclude this aya understanding this aya that the expansion of uh, allah's messenger's chest was done due to the hardship involved in conveying the message every day non stop and due to the heavy quran being sent down on on him and i think we mentioned how he would receive the quran uh, ayats of quran last week as well that it would <clears throat> physically was very very heavy duty work i don't know maybe the blood pressure would go up or down uh, but something physically would happen he would be sweating badly um and emotionally it was extremely draining and uh, psychologically as well ووضعنه عنك وزرك and we removed from you your burden وضع is to remove to take off or uh, to take away and wizr is great burden something you can uh, you know you are unable to carry so heavy it could crush you now a burden carrying in in arabic hamal hamal is also burden carrying but hamal burden is number 1 a burden which the other person can bear the the the, the heaviness 
That's why the pregnancy in Arabic is called Hamal, because although it's a big burden that the, the, the uh, uh, woman is carrying, but at the end they, they can, number one, they can carry it, and at the end they will, they will be a relief. Whereas visor is something which you, it's unbearable. You just simply cannot carry that weight. It's so heavy that it makes you feel crushing. Okay, that's what visor is. Um, we go to the next ayah. Alladhi anqadha dhahra, which had weighed upon your back. So that visor, that uh, unbearable burden, so heavy that it seems as if it's crushing your back. This is what it means. The two ayahs together make sense then. Anqadha, anqadha means place such a burden on something that it's about to crack. Now, this is, as I said earlier, this is all figurative and uh, metaphorical expression. It's not, um, it's not in real, uh, the, the ayah, you know, the, the whole situation is not real. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam back, Alhamdulillah, was fine. He was fighting wars in, uh, in the next phase of his life in Medina. He used to walk for miles and miles. And remember, he was walking up the Mount uh, um, Hira, um, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then gave him the prophethood. But it is a metaphorical way of expressing the burden of anxiety, the depression, the feeling of sadness around him, uh, what was happening around him was just, uh, ref um, um, was against his sensitive nature. So what was this burden? Okay, so we're going to we're going to pinpoint some um, burdens that the scholars have um, have wrote down that these were the main burdens in uh, he, um, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's time. Search for truth and purpose. The first burden, which is being classified as search and truth, uh, search for truth and purpose. Allah's messenger would always feel uncomfortable because he was pondering, reflecting, seeking the purpose in life. In uh, Surah At-Duha last week, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Allah reminded the Prophet, did he not find you wandering and direct you? Meaning that you knew what was the state of the people. You were upset about the state of uh, your community going downhill, morality and everything and idol worshipping. But you just did not know how to cope with the situation. You, you, you were not on the right track. You did not know the right tools. You didn't have the right tools and just was not able to, to, to help those people. Now, he وسلم, was desperate for truth doing deep reflection within the cave of Hera, the search for truth weighing down upon him to the extent that it was, it was going to break, it seems as it's going to break his back. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent J Angel Jibreel with the truth. And what was the truth? The Quran, the message of, first of all, the message of one true God. And that made so much sense to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And from there on, he got his tools to work through this jungle of ignorance. One man was given one tool, Quran, and there's a huge jungle of ignorance. And he was ready to fight through because he did so much reflection and he was so confused how to get hold of, uh, of this situation. And when he got the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was relieved. He knew he can do it now. Okay, society. He wanted to help his society as a whole. Um, and he was always first to take part in anything good which would help people uh, or specifically poor people. So he was involved in a pact which was done to help the weak and poor. He wanted to help the poor people, but society around him had so much corruption and injustice that it was hard to gain much success 
in field, uh, in such a field. So imagining helping a lot of people, but realizing that the harm and corruption is increasing, your effort seems like they aren't getting anywhere. So you, so, so, sorry, you care so much about your people, but there isn't much achievement. And the sadness that is almost, this, this saddened the Prophet Sallallahu because although he was helping people, but he, it was, nothing was getting better. So it was like a drop, his help was like a drop in the ocean of corruption and injustice. Okay, another reason of uh, his uh, breaking his back feeling, heavy, heavy, uh, feeling was the pause of revelation. So we've done that in extent last week um, uh, in Surah at doha Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, your Lord has neither left you nor has he become displeased with you. Remember, okay, so um, there was a pause. So the disbeliever, remember how last week we uh, discussed how the disbelievers started to insult and abuse him and said that your Lord hates you. That's why he stopped sending you Quran. So Allah sent Surah Doha in return. This burden of waiting made the messenger of Allah's chest tighten since he had to wait patiently for the next uh, revelation while hearing all the insults and ridicule by his own people. Then when Allah, uh, okay, um, be the messenger of Allah. He is the final messenger of Allah. So no one other uh, than him himself will come later. And he knew that. He knew that he is the messenger sent not only for his own people in Mecca, he is sent for the whole of the mankind, not in his era, but all the eras and generation up till Allah choose to finish this world. He is the only messenger from now on. And that's a huge, great burden on his shoulder because he knew that if he failed in conveying his message, not only his own people will uh, be destroyed or... Uh, you know, um, the whole of the mankind will be at lost. So this uh, made him more anxious. He knew that time is passing by so quickly. He just have few years of his lifetime to convey this huge message in in a fashion that it stays for the rest of the uh, uh, in the world always, and it is conveyed to the last man on earth as well and Allah subhanahu and he was always anxious and uh, you know getting um, uh, depressed about it if things are not happening his way so Allah reminded him in uh, surah al ghashia fadhakir innama anta muzakir you are only a reminder so you remind you are only a reminder so his job Allah then described but his his job his job is not to guide people into islam his job is to give them information whatever their reaction and whatever the end result is is got nothing to do with him anymore that is now in allah's hand so his job is only uh, to convey and that's why these people were called messengers and raised high for you, your repute, your mention, uh, your remembrance. By elevating his mention, Allah has already made Islam victorious. He has made Muhammad the messenger of Allah's, uh, he has made Muhammad the messenger of Allah's name high, so the message is widespread and he is honored and followed by men. Okay, number one, Allah's messenger is mentioned along with Allah's name in everything. In Shahada, which is the testimony of faith, Ashadu la ilaha illa la ilaha illa la hu, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Okay, and then Adhan, and then Tashhad. When we sit down in prayers, uh, when we're doing the last section of prayer, at Tahayyat, um, we also do the Rood and Salam uh, salutation on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
So his name is mentioned next to Allah. What a great honor it is that his name is mentioned next to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Rafa, Rafa means raised high. And if you notice, Rafa here is used, and you remember what uh, Um Jamil, the auntie of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to ridicule him uh, and try to humiliate him by saying, what the ah, your Lord has removed you, uh, is, is cut you off. Uh, and then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, ma wad'aka wa ma qala rabbuka wa ma qala. Uh, your Lord has neither um, removed you, cut you off, or is displeased. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts the opposite of wada is raf'a, raised high. And dhikr, dhikr has got two things. Dhikr is um, remembering something by tongue and remembering something in your heart. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated his uh, وسلم's mention and by tongue, people remembering him by tongue and people remembering him in the heart as well. And in his in their in, in their actions, when we are following a sunnah, which is physical, so we are remembering the Prophet in our actions, we are remembering him in our words when we are pre, uh, sending salutation and in our hearts as well. OK. Let's see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this system of, of remembering Prophet sallallahu at all time on this earth. Never mind the angels. At Fajr Salah, the sun rises, so the Muaddan, who is the caller of prayer, says, Ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. You know, he is, he is doing the adhan. I witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Two or three minutes later, the sun is higher, um, so the time for Fajr has started in the next town. And there Muaddan would say, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And the Fajr sunrise gradually reaches the next country. So the Muaddan there is starting his uh, adhan and saying, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. The Fajr sunrise adhan spread halfway around the earth. So the Fajr is halfway around the world and there is um, an echo of Ashadu uh, Anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And when at halfway the prayer of Dhuhr started to those area which first Fajr hit, okay? When Fajr started first to those area, now it's their Dhuhr time. And again the Muaddan uh, saying Ashadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah. The highest rank in in Jannah. Allah, okay. Second, Allah honored His Messenger Muhammad sallallahu wasallam by making following the Messenger equal to following Allah. He who obeys the Messenger has obeyed Allah, but those who turned away, we have not sent you over them as a guardian. Allah subhanahu wa taala saying that in Surah An Nisa. Third. He also sent Salat uh, and Salam upon him and the angels did as well. And he told the believers to do so. In Al-Ahzab, Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Indeed, Allah confers blessing upon the Prophet and his angel also ask him to confer blessing upon the Prophet. Oh, you have, oh, you who have believed, Ask Allah to confer blessing upon him and ask Allah to grant him peace. Four, he also called him by loving titles. What were these titles?
title, Ya Ayyuhan Nabi, Ya Ayyuhan Rasul. In comparison to this, Allah says to his other prophets throughout in Quran, Ya Adam, Ya Musa, Ya Yahya, Ya Isa, Ya Harun. But he never even says Ya Muhammad once in the Quran. He only calls him by respectable titles. This is an amazing honor because whenever Allah does mention the name Muhammad or Ahmad, he will always accompany it with an honorable title or Rasul Allah next to it. The only exception to this is uh, Surah Muhammad itself, where Allah mentioned the name Muhammad. No Ya Muhammad, just Muhammad. Uh, number five, the last one, Allah mentioned in previous scriptures the mention of his uh, final messenger, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He ordered the previous prophets that if he did come within their life, they would support him and that even their followers would uh, supposed to support, uh, follow him. And this is also in Surah al asab Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling the previous uh, messengers that there will be my last prophet coming, your last brother will come, and if he comes within your uh, lifetime, uh, which Allah knew would not happen, but can happen within the lifetime of the followers of that particular a prophet, then they are supposed to leave your instructions and follow the new instructions. For indeed, with hardship will be ease. Okay, to understand this ayah more, more, let's look at the words more closely. So pay a little attention here. Inna, inna means surely. Okay, and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying surely, then that is more than definite. <clears throat> Osir means difficulty or time of difficulty. Yusr is easy, smooth, without uh, effort, struggleless. So surely with hardship, there is relief. Okay, this is what we translated. But if you look at it more closely, the Arabic word here, Osir, the word Osir, which is difficulty, has got the lamb here, Al, Alif and Lam. When you put Alif and Lam, Al, that is the, it becomes definite particular, it's not general. So here it means one difficulty, it also means one. OK, a particular one. So there is one difficulty, but with the ease, with the user, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put tanween. Can you see these two two uh, fathas together? It's called tanween and it gives a noon sound. If if I don't stop in this uh, ayah, I would say yusran. OK, but because I stop here, I would say yus uh, <clears throat> or yusra, not yusra, yusra. Um, when we put tanween or noon, it makes it into plural. So the, the ease become plural. So what it actually means is that surely, surely with one hardship, Allah will give plenty of eases. Subhanallah. This is what it, it actually means. So one hardship, plenty of eases afterwards. <clears throat> and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is repeating it. Inna ma'al usri yusra. Indeed, with hardship will be ease. So the benefit of mentioning the ayahs twice, this ayah twice. One is for the past and for the future. So number one is, one is is for the past and for the future. That is, you had ease when you were young and, and you will have ease in the future. We've discussed it in length how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ease in, in his past when he was a, a, a small orphan, how he sheltered him. And then his future, um, how he will make his uh, mission successful and Islam as a solid, strong, strong religion. After his death, Islam will expand to, to the four corners of the earth. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, however, 
this present time is hard and struggle. So concentrate on this hard and struggle time. The other um, uh, example, sorry, um, meaning can be one is for this life and one is for the next life. <clears throat> and in between is facing hardship. So this life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give him ease at the end uh, and starting as well with ease. And then in the hereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept favors for his prophet, for his last messenger, more than anybody who will enter uh, Jannah, inshallah. And then repetition is also for love, is giving extra, uh, you know, uh, backing, uh, assurity. It will be okay. It will be okay. This is done for assurance as well. And these two ayats are such a huge uh, lesson for me and you as well, that we there is nobody who will not have a difficult time in their lives because this world is the world. This life is our testing time for whatever Allah has prepared for us, inshallah, the Jannah. Um, um, and when we get anxious or difficult now, we should know that for a mu'min, for a Muslim, this, um, sorry, uh, for, for a Muslim, um, hope, hopelessness is, is not allowed. It's haram to have hopelessness. It is sinful to be hopeless, totally, because a hopeless person is, is um, totally enslaved of shaitan as well. For a Mormon or a Muslim, there should always be a light at the end of tunnel. So we should always, after understanding these two ayats, every time when I'm going through a difficult time, I always say, inna ma'al usri yusra, inna ma'al usri yusra. So inshallah, Allah will make things easy for me and for you, inshallah. Uh, okay. Let's go. So when you have finished your duties, then stand up for worship. On one hand, the messenger of Allah is talking to Allah, while on the other hand, he is talking with the worst people on the earth. And similar with Musa alayhi salam, on one hand, he is having a conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on the other hand, uh, he would then go and speak to Pharaoh. Uh, uh, when we are as much as he could and reflect and be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's why when things were not in his way he used to go in in um, you know uh, secluded area and uh, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and meditate there so once he became the prophet, his going to Hera was stopped. Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stopped that. And even in Medina, there were plenty of uh, caves, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stopped that. Um, in return, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him Qiyamul Layl, the Tahajjud time, the uh, early, the end, end of uh, night time of prayer. So once uh, Aisha radiallahu anha uh, said that, uh, I saw the Prophet Sallallahu I used to see him praying every night and he used to stand up such a long time that his feet used to swell up. And once I said to him that, uh, Ya Rasulallah, um, why you are struggling so much and exhausting yourself while when Allah has already given you your favors after you leave this world. And he said, uh, Ya Aisha, O oh Aisha, should I not be a thankful slave? So this was his way of thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, this was his way of relieving him from uh, exertion. 
wa ila rabbika farghab and to your lord direct your longing raghab raghab means inclined to attending or turning towards or taking a liking to something that's what raghab is so um Now you've been advised of tremendous ease coming your way. Always devote yourself to your master lovingly. Even in his sleep, the messenger of Allah would carry on doing zikr of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every time he used to turn his position while he is sleeping, he used to utter or, or say some words um, which are written in, in the little booklet of uh, Hisni Muslim as well. But I unfortunately I do not know because I, I am not blessed yet to do that. When I get up fully, yes, then then. But when I'm deep in my sleep, I don't know. Um, so when Allah's messenger has given dawah call to Islam all day, he was relieved at night and was devoted to his master in prayer in Tahajjud. So, you know, unfortunately for me and you, we feel that we are going to say or salah, let's finish our salah and then sit down and become easy. This is how our attitude with our, our worship is, honestly. Uh, um, you know, we as soon as Aisha starts, when my husband say, shall we say a prayer? I'm saying, let's let's finish the dinner. Let's let's do the kitchen. Let me do the kitchen first. I want to sit down. I want to do my uh, Aisha in peace and quiet. But honestly, then I become I become very sleepy. You know, sitting in front of the television, I've got my mouth open and I'm sleeping. So I've been up and you know running around and doing different things. Um, and so it's advisable to do by Aisha time. It is advisable to delay it before your bedtime so that you reflect on things, you ponder on things as well. But we we guys, we try to do it so that we are free. And it seems as if that's a burden that we have to do. It's a chore we have to do, unfortunately. But for people who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who try and struggle to be more close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, um, and may Allah make it easy, this journey for us as well. Standing up in the prayer mat is relieving themselves from all the tension and chaos and everything. And I know my one of my auntie used to say that she she's passed away. Uh, may Allah bless her in her uh, new life, uh, grant her tons of uh, rahma for, for her and for all the deceased people and for all the mums and dads and the uncles and aunties and grandparents and brothers and sisters and children. Unfortunately, we have to go through that as well. May Allah give their graves, illuminated graves and uh, blessings in their graves. Um, she used to say, I can't wait for the next prayer. And I used to get jealous of her because I will say, oh my God, the next prayer is just around the corner. Um, and she used to say, I feel so happy when I'm standing, uh, you know, I'm getting ready. She just would not wait. She could not wait for the next prayer. Subhanallah, may Allah make us uh, among those people. Um, and his last devotion, his final devotion. What was his final devotion? If we study the final days of uh, life of Allah's messenger, we see that he is preparing and devoting to returning to his master. He once said to his beloved wife Aisha, he said, Aisha, a slave was given a choice to stay in this world or to be with the master with his Lord. So a slave was given the choice to uh, stay in this world or to return to his master. And she said, what did the slave choose then, Ya Rasulullah? And he said, he chose the master. And she probably did not understood. She just thought, Prophet just telling her a, a story or something. So she related it to her uh, father, Sayyidina Abu Bakr anhu, and he started crying because he knew the slave who was given the choice was Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammadin 
كما صليت على إبراهيم ولا آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم ولا آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد آخر دعوانا على الحمد لله رب العالمين just just few minutes late so I'm I'm pleased with Allah's help we managed just 